So this is John Costa at the Documentary Media Centre. Um, welcome to the conversation today as part of our conflict memory and education project. Now, for those of you that have heard any of these conversations before, you'll know it's very much around trying to get behind the facts and figures or the headlines of the history of that particular moment in time, um, obviously conflict related. But as we've always discovered, it's always the human stories um, behind this and also the ramifications through family life and stories that are told um, that we get to actually probably really understand some of the uh, events that happened in World War II that you would not find in any book. I always say it's the book you'd go and buy in WH Smith's, the Encyclopedia of World War II. This would not in be included in there. Mm -hmm. And what's so fascinating, this, fascinating about this is it's a father and son, um, and we've got uh, uh, Cash, who's at the bottom of my screen <clears throat> uh, here in Leicester, and we've got Emil at the top, who's over in Toronto in Canada as well. So thank you for taking the time to join us to talk about your own personal connection. First of all, with this, um, you know, tragedy that happened on the 23rd of November in 1942. Um, the SS Tilawa, which was torpedoed by this uh, Japanese submarine, which we'll come on to. Um, and obviously, tragically, people lost their lives. There were survivors and their survivors tales. But again, sometimes it's not just the survivors, it's the people who lost a family member in the disaster that ultimately are the ones that are trying to maybe understand it a little bit more and find information because they don't have the survivors in their family as a testament. So um, um, who, who, who wants to go first? Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, look, um, John, first Let's of all, it, yeah. um, thanks for inviting us. It's, it's marvellous that we can join you today, John. Uh, of course, as you said, you've introduced me. I'm from Leicester. I'm a Leicester boy. I grew up in Leicester, uh, although I was born in Uganda, uh, in Ginger. But we came many moons ago, back in the late 60s. And uh, I grew up here. I was educated here. And, of course, I'm a broadcaster journalist for Subras Radio, which I particularly enjoy. And, uh, you know, with my son, as he's going to introduce himself now, um, We've got this massive project with that we're doing at the moment in relation to SS Dilawa. Okay, excellent. So, Emil, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having us. Very generous of you to allow us to share our story with your audience. Um, I was born and raised in London and uh, went to school there, played cricket there, uh, worked for Croydon Council for six and a half years. Uh, predominantly doing project management uh, in the chief executive's office. Uh, married uh, a Canadian, moved to Toronto. Uh, we've been married for 14 years now. My wife uh, is in medicine and I am now in financial planning. So my career really started uh, having my own practice, managing mutual funds and selling life insurance. And I did that for about six and a half years. And then I ended up working at one of Canada's largest banks uh, focused on wealth management strategies and uh, was there for four and a half years at TD Private Wealth. And now I'm working as an account executive uh, at Canada Life. It's uh, one of the oldest insurance companies in Canada. Uh, but I have a couple of other side hustles too. I, I have a, a travel agency that specializes in large group tours to the Middle East. And I've also tinkered around with uh, real estate investments too. So that's a kind of a, a summary of my secular background. Excellent. Now, now you've got obviously father and son, you've got, um, <laughs> you've got uh, a child yourself as well, um, Emil, one or is it just one you've got? I, I do. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're one and done. Uh, Luca Millen is his name. He's four and a half years old at the time of this interview. And uh, he was actually born uh, about a couple of weeks before our 10th wedding anniversary. So uh, we're having a lot of fun with him. He just started school and he's an absolute delight. Brilliant. Now, now you mentioned to me a couple of weeks ago when we were arranging this about, you know, you being a few hours behind us there in Canada. Uh, and you said to me when I was in the middle of the night when we were having a conversation, you were up with your child. Now, I want to focus um, on that child for one moment. And we'll, we'll come back to that conversation when we talk about what comes after the 80th celebration, because obviously at the 100th in 20 years time, some of us may or may not be here. I can see Cash raising his eyebrows there, same as I did. Uh, it's, it's a long time in the future. Um, you, you, your son will be 
20, you know, be like 24, 24 and a half. So, you know, we want to know, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about that's how we'll end today. You know, what's the what's the future with the project? And, um, you know, what, what's it going to be like for him in, in sort of 20 years time? So let's start right at the very beginning. Um, when do you both remember having this conversation for the first time? In relation to the to this disaster, yeah. yeah. When do you when do you, when do you do you was there a specific time that you remember having it? Was it finding something within the family? Yeah. Was you sharing a story? Yeah. How how old was a meal when you spoke about it? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe I can just start this one off because um, uh, a few years before my father passed away, um, you know, I I, I it's funny because I started to have more of a bonding with my father in the later years. Because, uh, you know, as Emil said, we were based in uh, London at the time, uh, South London, West Norwood area. And um, have it be that I kind of like moved back to Leicester. And then I had more of a kind of a rapport with my dad. You know, he, 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 he spent a lot of time talking about the past, you could say. And one day I, I kind of like spotted a photograph uh, in one of the cabinets in the lounge. And I always used to think, well, it's just, picture here I mean who is it of you know I've never I mean, he's never introduced that picture to us with the other family photographs and then my father said well actually that's my dad and I thought hold on I, I it was a bit confusing because it was like he's never spoken about that before and um the granddad that we thought was our granddad wasn't his you know wasn't my granddad it was his uncle that brought him up uh, from the age of nine years old and that's where the story starts uh john you know um you know it, it, it it's kind of like i just like became very numb during that time it was like very and and i had to sort of like work on him opening up to why this all happened uh but the lovely thing about this is he was my, my father was very close to a meal and i think he found that easy to talk to he, he was a more of an easy person to talk to and bring out those little elements of him growing my father growing up in India and Africa and and the person that actually brought him up and gave him a name uh, gave him a family that even today we we class them as our family our cousin brothers our aunties uncles so forth but the real father the real grandfather who perished on the SS Dilawa that's who he was that picture and that's what kick-started the journey Yes, yeah, I, I think it's amazing. The more conversations I have with people, there's normally a moment uh, in, invariably, you know, like you said, involved in the family where someone makes a comment and then someone turns around and goes, what did you just say? That's something I've never seen, heard, has ever been mentioned. Um, and I think you know, what, what comes after is the thing sometimes that's the most fascinating because it's how people remember it. You know, I mean, a, you know, a particular disaster or they're numb to certain things, you know, trauma. We were talking about you, the whole kind of Uganda 50 thing a minute ago, weren't we, about that sort of, you know, that kind of collective trauma. But people just kind of get on with their life. And it's only when you get a sort of a, a commemoration moment that people start reflecting back and allow themselves to think. Normally, when they get to a certain age, as you said there about your father, you know, what I mean, he'd he'd done his living, if you like, you know, he brought his children into the world and all that sort of stuff. And then you start getting a little bit reflective so what what age were you Emil at this time when you were talking to your grandfather about these um uh, about these events so leading up to to that moment um and just going back to what my my father was alluding to my father had that conversation with his father towards the end of 2007 so I would have been 20 years old at the time and I can't remember how my father was able to locate this information specifically in terms of search words and the name of the ship. But I remember getting a text message from my father saying, this is the ship, this is the passenger list, and this is Bapa's dad's name, Nicha Bapa, Nicha Chiba. And we saw it on the passenger list. And that was that was a monumental identity recheck, reset moment 
for the two of us because we're thinking, hold on, here's a, a real human being who had a life, a marriage, a child, a place in a village in India, was obviously trying to do something good for his family. He's gone, you know, it lost out in the middle of the Indian Ocean and nobody's ever done anything about it, said anything about it, or tried to even preserve his memory. And so at that moment, we're thinking, you know, sometimes as, as, as people, we go from one extreme to the other, we overcompensate. Maybe it was because 50 years ago, we, we didn't really place emphasis on emotional intelligence or kind of the psychological aspect of our people. Maybe in the Indian culture, we haven't done a great job of communicating our thoughts and feelings. Maybe some families, some communities um, haven't prioritized protecting that heritage and trying to transfer that from one generation to another. I mean, it can very innocently and ignorantly be done when you're moving to a new country or trying to learn a new language or dealing with perhaps racism or other economic hardships. And the last thing you want to do is remember where you came from or to keep that at the forefront of your identity. And so now here I am, you know, in my late twenties, uh, getting ready for marriage, getting ready to immigrate to Canada. And my father drops this bomb on me. And uh, it was interesting because when I was 18 years old, my father gave me this chain, uh, which I've nicknamed the Kacholi chain uh, because uh, it, it has a sentimental connection. I'm also wearing the, the ring that my grandfather gave me with, with his initial. And uh, what we care about is being able to transfer that heritage from one generation to the other. So what's interesting about this chain is we call it the, the Vallabhapa connection because this chain was given by my grandfather's uncle, who, who we thought was our real great grandfather, to my father, I believe, during, you know, my parents' wedding. And then my father passed that on to me. So we were always grateful for what Vallabhapa did. I mean, he was an incredible, humble, loving human being who took my grandfather, gave him a new name, gave him a new identity, took him to Africa, treated him as his own son, really gave him that prominence of a firstborn and ensured that he was properly set up for a new life in England as well with his with his children. And, um, you know, he was very good to, to my father. So, you know, we, we were very mindful of not disregarding that side. And actually my grandfather leading up to his death was, was always speaking about Vallabhapa and Kasiba, his wife. Interestingly, uh, the story goes, uh, back in the day, you would often get a couple of siblings marrying a couple of siblings. siblings yeah. yeah. And so Vallabhapa, uh, son number one, and our great-grandfather, son number two, from the village of Kacholi, marry two sisters, uh, Kasi Ben and Mancha Ben, from the village of Kansar. And, and so there was always a, a close bond between these two houses. They, they lived next to one another. And so my grandfather, now to answer your original question, uh, started to share these little moments during his childhood and helping me to connect the dots. You have to remember that he was born on March 1st, 1933. The Tilawa tragedy was November, 1942. So he was nine years old. And uh, we have a picture of my grandfather with his original Indian passport in 1950, he would have been 17 years old at the time. All of his documentation 
in in India was always Ranchor Bai, Nietzsche Bai, Solanke. And all of his documentation in Africa and in the UK was Ranchor Bai, Vallabh Bai, Solanke. And so here my father and I are trying to figure out, are we trying to preserve a, an old line of lineage or a, or a new line of, of lineage? And, and now, as we approach uh, 2012, um, I would have been uh, in my mid-20s then. It was the last time I saw my grandfather. I actually came over uh, to England for the weekend. It was July 2012 uh, for my, my best mate's wedding, nipped up to Leicester. And uh, my grandfather and I actually, since I, I left Britain in September 2009, we, we had a ritual that I did everything I could to to call him every day at, at 12 noon um, UK time. And so, you know, that closeness maintained. But when I was there with him, there was this adamance, cute also, you know, but adamance, find the ship, find my dad, find the location of the body over and over and over again. And, you know, that was really the first time. And then it kind of continued on the phone. And you might think, you know, is this elderly gentleman having a senile moment? Is he, is he deteriorating mentally? No, he was very, very sharp. But towards the end of his life, there was this huge rush of emotion to to preserve the memory of his father. And, you know, what are you supposed to say to your grandfather uh, who's who was at the time 79 years old? Oh, yeah, I, I can't really live up to that commitment, but sure, we'll, we'll try. But then when he, you know, when we went uh, to India in January 2013, my father and I, it was a father-son trip. Again, you know, we had gone for a wedding and... This was the first time that as an adult, I was able to go back to my roots because I was about four years old at the time when my father took me to our village. And here we are talking to many of our relatives that we never knew before. And you know what's funny, John? They knew all about the the this ship sinking. And they knew all about my grandfather's uh roots and and his real father like it was nothing oh it was old hat is fact of life it don't really know anything else and so we were trying to now understand the culture of our family and our community in england and then that of our culture and community in the village uh of of gocholi sadly my grandfather passed away at the age of 80 uh in april of 2013 and it was, you know, what do we do from here? So that, does that answer your question? Yeah, oh no, beautifully. Yeah, no, that's exactly, exactly what I was after really. And because what it does then is it leads really into this amazing archive that you've created of, you know, survivors accounts, news, and, uh, you know, interviews that you've managed to do. Um, that you know through the through the power of the internet we talk of it being quite a negative thing most of the time in the mainstream media so actually talk about how the internet is a wonderful thing for being able to reach out and connect people but also allow um, dare I say ordinary people like us to you know decide to have an archive of something that's important to us maybe not of national significance but certainly personal significance to you and I sit in my own museum as a testament to that's exactly what you can do if you set your mind to it is You've created this website now where, you know, this story is explained very well. And I know people will go off because that's what the intention is to drive them to look at the website and, you know, research it themselves and think about these kind of elements. What was the what was it? Was there a conscious decision to do something like that rather than just a commemoration or, you know, a bench or a tree, you know, to actually, well, actually put it up online and see see what happens. How, what conversations do you have about that? I think I think, um, John, if I just come in here, what happened is just just leaving from where Emil, what Emil said after my father passed away. Uh, yeah, we had I managed to get hold of pictures of the ship, uh, the passenger list that was got really exciting, you know. And then uh, there were some articles that I found going back to the 65th uh, kind of like anniversary commemoration in Africa 
South Africa, there's a lot of people involved in the incident of on the SS de Lauer, and they got their own foundation, uh, a few gentlemen there and their families. For a while, we rested, um, I think, for a couple of years. And then, you know, in our own minds, we were just doing the research. And I came across the name of the submarine, the picture. And then all of a sudden, you just had this movie going on in your mind, in your mind's eye. I just, I could, the submarine, the people on the submarine, um, the passengers list, the area where the ship initially stood as it sailed out of Bombay. Uh, I believe it was a Sunday it sailed out, I think, uh, in, uh, in 1942. And when the, the, the crowd was brought back, but some of these pictures were on the internet. So then me and my son would um, back and forth. And obviously he's five hours ahead. We'd be talking right into the middle of the night, just churning over, over the many, 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 many years, you know. Um, and then, of course, uh, Emil started to uh, put the, the jigsaw puzzle together. And then he founded the um, the, the Tilawa1942.com, the website. And, and now it's, it's, it's an inside book. It's an encyclopedia full of loads of gems that um, the amount of research that we've done, it's, it's just phenomenal. Just putting everything in there. It all related to SS Dilawa, which wasn't there, you know, only just 10 years ago. So um, I think that's one moment we really feel proud that we've actually got something set up. Oh, yes, there we go. Yeah, so share the website here because <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's nice to come across something that's so, one, so well put together and extensive. And I think it's Absolutely. a kind of testament to your commitment, both of you, to be able to present the story with as many different you know angles as well i do like the fact that you know you've got not only on sort of what it's about and why you're doing it and acknowledging people but also you break it down very well and you also value the work that's been done by others because it's almost like a joint investigative uh, approach from people and, and particularly when you get into sort of you know the passenger information and things like you know the passenger list who's missing survivor accounts i think it's really important that you present all of this information, not necessarily for people to, it's for them to make their own judgment, find out themselves, you know, immerse themselves in the story themselves, rather than sort of, you guys are not necessarily presenting the truth. What you're trying to say to people is, look, you know, these are some facts that we know from our personal perspective. Your story, your family stories as a survivor or someone that's missing is as important. You need to kind of join in. What kind of feedback have you had from the site from people overseas that you've reached out to or met or anything like that well there's 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 two things firstly actually if you click on the reviews uh that will perhaps answer your your question on the uh initial reaction that we that we had so of course you can see there uh keith faz uh who was an mp in leicester for many years he's actually interviewed us twice on his talk show and um, we've had some maritime lawyers and other family members that have reached out. So that's that's one. But secondly, we've had families reach out to us now because of the website. Just today, I received an email of another person from the Arya Samaj in the uh, Palmer community on my mother's side. Um, whose father-in-law was actually on Tilawa, he survived. We had the Patel family in Birmingham who said, we didn't know anything about this ship. We have always wondered what happened. We lost our grandfather on that ship. Thank you for helping us provide closure. Uh, we met two families um, about 10 minute drive or so from the house that I lived in for 22 years in South London. One gentleman is the last known survivor, Mr. Arvind Bajani, who's now 83 years old. He was three years old at the time when his mother wrapped him in a sari and jumped into a lifeboat. And, you know, he <clears throat> his wife and daughter to the commemoration this month. But there was also another gentleman um, who's 93 years old, Mr. Mervyn Massiel, uh, originally from Goa, who was 13 years old at the time, studying in a Jesuit school in, in near Bombay, when he lost both his parents and his three young siblings, 
on the Talaba tragedy. Um, we've also come across another gentleman in East London, the president of the Gujarati Durji uh, Samaj community, whose father actually survived Talaba and was hanging on to a plank for two days on an empty stomach, vomiting, trying to hold on for dear life. So, you know, to answer your original question of what was leading up to this website and kind of just thinking of my father's comments where there was a couple of years after my grandfather's passing away in 2013, there wasn't much more that we could do because apart from the SS Tilawa Foundation website, a group of three Muslim gentlemen from South Africa who had some family members who survived and some family members who perished. Um, and they had a couple of photographs and the passenger list, but there was nothing else really out there. So what was the next milestone? Well, it was in 2017 uh, when we found out, you will not believe it, that a British uh, company, uh, Argentum Exploration Limited, I think it was founded by a, a, a well-known racing driver, Ross Hyatt. It set up a company to go and explore um, where in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the silver bars, uh, the silver bullion um, of, of Tilawa was. And he was successful in being able to, uh, you know, complete the salvage. And when he had brought the silver back to Southampton and declared it at the receiver of wreck, that would now escalate into a full-blown maritime unprecedented legal case between the Republic of South Africa and Argentum Exploration. So now, because of that research that they had performed and now submitted into the courts, we would have a resurrection of our research and we would have uh, an, a new chapter opening up. And remember my grandfather's wishes. Yeah, the location. Yeah. Find the ship and the location of his father. And so, you know, we were able to reach out to the representatives, legal representatives of, uh, of Argentum Exploration to let them know our interest, our connection to the story, um, and that really was the motivation to then start the website Tilawa1942.com and to become a global ambassador of the story, to create this centralized, comprehensive resource um, and to now use this court case as leverage to get attention around the world and to get other families uh, coming forward. Can I just say, um, yeah, John, you know, up before that time, John, um, you know, after my father's death, things got quiet. There was only the folks in South Africa that may have laid a bit of foundation and they did a lot of research. So we're really grateful to them. But everybody that we've spoken to, uh, you know, they said, well, we don't really speak about it. It's something that we know about or kind of happened or some people said it was a folk tale, uh, but nothing was said about it for all these years and you can imagine you know up to now 80 years you know uh and nobody's spoken about it my dad did mention about uh his real father Nietzsche by Chiba by Solanki he traveled with another companion his cousin brother from the same village they're about the similar age mid-20s 25 26 etc now he survived of course my granddad perished but even then, he never spoke about it as well. All this time in Leicester, he was the only survivor on our doorsteps, you know, all these years. Um, so, you know, that's something we'll never know, how they travelled from Gujarat on the train or whatever to the ship. Where were they on the ship? What were they doing? Only this one person who was uh, part of the family um, tree, you could say, fam they're, they're part of our family, uh, Mr. Deuji by Baga by Solanki. Uh, obviously, he's no more, but it, it's something that me and my son talk about all the time. If only, you know, I'm sure he would have mentioned some stuff to my dad because my dad always used to say little bits here and there. 
that Deuji Baga was bitten by fishes. He was on a wooden plank part of the ship floating for two days. And we all just kind of like, it's horrific. That must be horrific. Two days in the sea, in the dark, throughout the day. And then they get picked up by, uh, I believe it's the HMS Birmingham. And there was another ship as well. Um, Carthage, and, I think. Yeah, RMS Carthage. SS Carthage. Yeah, yeah. Then they were taken to the Ballard Pier, uh, where, where the port is in Bombay and still is. Um, and so he would have known. He went back to the village. Apparently, according to record, they waited for a month for my dad's real dad, or our grandfather, to come. He never came. And that's where it stopped. I think after that, it became a bit of a taboo topic. So today, now, you know, we are at the 80th anniversary in the, I think the clock said, is it 17 days or something like 17 that? 17 days, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and wow, what a journey, John, what a journey, you know. We've just we've just been on all, all cylinders firing, you know, um, and, we, you know, our goal was to um, remember everyone who's passed away and so many over 600 survived, but they all leave a story behind. Absolutely. I mean, that's 600 threads, isn't it, that kind of go off and change the world. How many and impact people's people. lives were displaced, yeah. the yeah. trauma. And I think Emil spoke about uh, an elderly gentleman, I think he's 93 now, in South Croydon, Mervyn, lovely gentleman. Um, and he lost five members in his family. But when I, when I, I went to see him a few weeks ago personally, and there's that dreaded kind of like trauma. You know, you've lost five people in your family. You're only a teenager. Where do you go back in 1942? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we we, we want to remember everybody for this 80th. Um, but um, I think the goal we had when we first kicked off this story was what my, my father said to my son, you know, Emil. And, and we want to remember our granddad Nietzsche Bai he was forgotten all these years and I think we have this goal that he will not be forgotten you know he died tragically but I, you know nothing was said about him afterwards and as a family you know my sisters my brothers you know we've just been left in the dark for all these years mm -hmm. you know and I just feel it's it's very touching for me you know and yeah. I think um, we're looking forward to the 80th in a few weeks in Bombay now, 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 as we build, as we build up to that, obviously you've been getting some amazing media coverage. I'll come to you in a second, Emil. You'll be getting some media, amazing media coverage. Now, I wrote, I wrote it all down because there was too much. Too much. Um, Eastern Eye, South London Press, Sunday Mo Mumbai Mirror, The Times of India, The Sunday Midday Mumbai, Sabras Radio, obviously with the legend that is Don Kotak. <laughs> uh, ITV News London recently, obviously, with the survivor that you were talking about and all the various little conversations and stuff that you've been having. And obviously with me today, which for which I'm very grateful, it it kind of builds up very nicely to the 80th. But of course, all of this media is generated through your commitment to be able to mark the event, you know, with no kind of official support as such or official funding. I'm sure you gentlemen like like myself here, you know, you fund it yourself because you're passionate about it and you want people to know that it happened or it existed. What's what's your what what do you really want to come out of the 80th um, uh, event at the hotel in, you know, in Mumbai? You know, uh, the thing is, John, uh, initially, and I'll be honest, when we started this off uh, with me and Emil, you know, I kept saying, you know, I've got to do something charitable in the village. Um, let's recognize it in this, you know, let's do this. We were having all these um, brainstorming ideas. But very quickly, because of my contacts and the uh, the influence that Amil can provide, um, it was getting bigger. But we just kept banging on the doors, you know, of media. In, it's, it's been hard work. But I think in the last, um, in particular, three months, it started to pick up soon as we started to find these individuals and these individuals contacted Emil and me and it's got bigger and bigger. But the media has been tough, even with my contacts. It's been very tough, not just in the UK, but in India as well. But I think it's been like a jigsaw okay. puzzle, one added on top of like a uh, building the whole picture and try to get PR. And remember, we're doing the PR ourselves. You know, we don't have a budget for this. So from a small thing, and maybe a dinner with a local... A family in the village and um, you know at that time it was just me gonna go because of budget and everything else but 
soon we realized that, hold on, you know, it's already in one or two papers. We've got to keep going. We're not going to give up. We don't want, we, it's not about just Leicester or a little corner in the village in London or wherever. This has to be worldwide because people are, have, you know, traveled internationally now, you know, who are on the ship, their families, their children, etc. And and that's proof in the pudding now where we are at this stage today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 and, and we won't mention the other um, uh, press and media that's happening in, over the next, I would say, seven to eight days. And we're really excited about that because it's really now, uh, you know, we're just not non-stop. It's just non-stop interviews and writing quotes and so forth for India and here, John. It's kind of getting up that head of steam, isn't it? So, yeah. so Emil, I'm going to come to you now because we mentioned your son earlier who at the 100th anniversary will be 24. What would, you know, what's your vision from the 80th? We spoke about y y your dad there, what he'd like to see, um, you know, the knee event and stuff. But, you know, in, in 20 years time, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking a small exhibit at a museum in, in Mumbai? Are we talking, you know, what are we going to do with this archive? If more people come forward now, does it keep going? Is your commitment to keep the keep the website going? Yeah, I mean, my my perspective was once we knew the location of the ship and we had a bit more leverage with access to information and now we have the website and more families come together, we would have the first opportunity to memorialize the loss of life, to acknowledge that the tragedy happened, to unite three countries uh, south africa uk and india it really is a british indian story um it, it's a story that belongs to many indian people in england uh, a lot of the passengers on tilaba were gujarati so you've got that perspective too yes there was that motivation of um making sure that nichabapa had an identity it was one of the first things i actually did go onto the rec site official profile for SS Tilawa. And some of the passengers there have been added and they have their own little profile. And that was something that I wanted to do was to make sure that he has an identity online. And, you know, when you think of the Holocaust and other tragedies, there'll often be a well-known face that symbolizes that tragedy and and really is the face of those who were forgotten and perished during the holocaust very similar to uh tilawa really we wanted our great grandfather nichababa who drowned to be the face of the tragedy and so we feel that we've now accomplished that um as we go into initiatives it's difficult because not everybody's interested in the story and those that you think might help you end up not being able to deliver. And so you're constantly being creative to network, to sow seeds, to branch out, to get to know new people. And you're wondering, you know, which country is going to lead the Tilawa story? Is it going to be India? Is it going to be the UK? Is it going to be South Africa? Well, it was Britain that kind of instigated the the interest again because of the court case. And so, you know, I thought, well, let's go to the Greenwich Maritime Museum. Uh, let's see if they've set up any oceanic galleries. Um, but then, you know, hey, it's a Second World War story, so maybe we should shift it to the Imperial War Museum. And then those two museums have, haven't figured out, you know, who wants to take it. And uh, and and it, it's just one door closing after another. And so then we thought, well, how about India? We wrote letters to a variety of 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 institutions. Uh, it was helpful that Keith Vaz did that first interview with us on Like a Radio back in March of 2022. That gave us a bit of a platform to leverage off. And then my father had attended. Um, a Zoom session at the uh, Mumbai, the Maritime Mumbai Society. I believe it was founded by the retired Vice Admiral uh, Indra Shil Rao. And so that was an opportunity to bond with them. 
And uh, I was then able to develop a relationship with the Vice Admiral, with Captain Bahal and their assistant, Anita Yuwali. And we got their support. We got their interest to then say, look, we will help you organize this commemoration. And we thought, well, where could we have it? And very quickly, it was evident that the Ballard Estate, the Ballard Pier, the Grand Hotel is the perfect spot because that's where Tilawa last left. That's where the survivors came to. The hotel was in usage during the middle of the Second World War, and uh, it still had that British colonial vibe too. Uh, so that that was really the, the build-up. We also wanted to manage the family's expectations because we felt there was this noose. We were not allowed to talk about Nichabapa period. We were not allowed to memorialize him and to remember the tragedy and to make sure that this becomes part of our family identity and also an aspect of our uh, Samaj history too. So when you ask, well, what now? What happens after you know you get a bit more attention at the commemoration? Where do we go from here? My dream has always been a documentary and a movie. The challenge is they're both very expensive. You can't have a documentary without having photographs and videos of the wreck site. And so you very quickly turn to, okay, let's write a story let's get a script and let's pitch a movie idea, which for me would would be quite easy to do. Uh, there's a lot of nuances and complexities to give um, a variety of audience good entertainment and education. Um, and it's quite expensive to get a subsea vessel to go out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, not close to anything. Uh, 3,500 meters deep, that's over two miles. Uh, it's not safe, it's not easy. And we're also still trying to build a trusted rapport with our gentum so that, you know, they will share whatever they have. And at this point, we haven't been successful. I don't think anybody has been because of the tension and the complexities around the, 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 the legal issues there. But if we have that, we can also learn more about what happened. There would be some clues as to, you know, who was responsible for what took place, what happened in that 60 to 90 minute, minute period between the first and the second torpedo. Uh, so continued research, leverage to get access to perhaps documents from the days of the empire, because for in, for example, you, you think of McKinnon McKenzie, the, the old office there, the ticket office at the Ballard Estate, they had a flood in the mid nineties and pretty much whatever documents they had was destroyed. So when India became independent from British rule, did the British take their documents back from colonial period to England? How do we get access to it? Are there any other top secret files that exist at the Department of, of Defense or Transportation that would be of help to us. So, you know, in some areas we've made some progress, but in other areas we're just at the beginning. So, you know, when my son is 24 and a half years old and, you know, we are acknowledging the 100th anniversary of the SS Tilawa, um, I, I hope my father will still be alive then. He'll, he'll just have to hit the treadmill more. He should be around 89. <laughs> 80. I, feel, I feel like I should stop this game for uh, this recording <laughs> yeah. now and let us just have a conversation about uh, yeah, Cash's next uh, fitness regime to make sure we get you to the 100. Yeah. <laughs> I, think what, um, I think what Emil said about... He'd be around 89 years old. But just, just to finish uh, my, my thought here, John's question... Um, I would like Luca, you know, you, you, you don't know what your son is going to become. You want to expose him to lots of interesting opportunities and you want to open many doors to him. He has to make his own choices and live his life. But what we do hope is that he will have the appreciation for his roots and his heritage. And Tilawa 1942, The Forgotten Tragedy, is part of that. 
So when he's 24 and a half years old, around the time that I was, when, you know, talking to my grandfather about this story, I hope that we would have had a lot more documentation. I hope that a lot more families will come forward. I hope that by then, both maritime museums in Gujarat, Mumbai, and in Britain and South Africa will have a little section dedicated to the Talawa tragedy. And I hope that a movie or a documentary has also been made from that. You look, this, this initiative, this project, this campaign is not about us uh, trying to get a few moments of fame. Uh, we, we take it as a British Indian responsibility um, to our grandfather and our great grandfather uh, to put Tilawa back on the map, to make sure it's prominently featured, to be custodians of the story, uh, to make sure that we, we continue to knock on every door, that we continue uh, to make sure that, you know, uh, that the other families um, have their opportunity too to share to share their side. A real collection of stories, isn't it? Cash, what were you, what were you going to say? I was say? just saying, um, yeah, you know, like, obviously we're coming to the 80th, but all along this journey of research and knocking on doors, you know, we've had brainstorming ideas. And as Amil just alluded, things like documentaries or making a movie uh, or even a stage drama. And for those who are or will be watching this video or listening to the audio of this, if anybody's interesting, please do get in touch with our foundation, you know, uh, Dilawa1942.com and share your ideas, especially script writing, mm. especially stage uh, in particular. That's something that I, I think I'm going to be looking at doing. Um, I can see it being an amazing uh, stage production. Uh, I, I don't think it's just the 80th. I think moving on, just being creative and keeping it alive one way or the other. I think initially, I'm a true believer of true stories. And I think when we do watch a true story, whether it be a documentary or a movie, initially it may seem a boring thing. But as soon as you get gripped into the movie, isn't it? You end up saying, wow, what a movie. Wow, I didn't know this happened. It's just like got me on the edge of the seat. And there's so many stories, not just in Hollywood, but in like in Bollywood as well. They're, mm. Recently, they've made a lot of true stories and they've become hits. I suppose because of the songs, but nevertheless, they 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 become very um, moving uh, kind of movies. But this is not just about, you know, uh, as Amil said, fame. It's really bringing this story to life, and I think there's a lot more to go. There's more mileage in this than just doing the 80th. You know, 80th is just to remember and say, hey, we're back on the map, and we haven't forgotten you guys. You know, wherever you are in the world, the families, and certainly those who perished. And we yeah. and then and then John, you know, we're having it on the day, yeah, twenty third of November. We're actually pitching it on that day, so so you know we're looking forward to it. It's been a lot of hard work, and a bit more hard work to come yet. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, I think you guys have done a, an amazing job, um, you know, and, and, I, and I genuinely I mean that as well because, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that what I do with what I do here at the Museum Archive and Library, I'm able to run the Conflict Memory and Education Project specifically to turn around and say, well, look, we know what happened in that conflict, but there's all these human stories. How are we getting that into the memory of that conflict? And how do we educate people now? Many people turn around and go, well, they wouldn't teach that in class. And they learn about Henry VIII and the Mary Rose and all that sort of stuff. But it's, it's not education in its classic sense it's more about the fact that it just exists for people to have those conversations and just coming back to what you were saying there cash about uh stage performance you know uh and because obviously as a documentarian it'd be like yeah let's make a documentary um and then you've got the sort of life of pie kind of you know all at sea uh, sort of uh, big blockbuster over here whereas that stage play sometimes i think because it allows you to have that human connection because okay. of the way that you engage with the medium it's yeah. not on screen. You can't watch it on your laptop. You're in a theatre. And some of the stuff that's been done recently about Uganda 50 um, and some of the other uh, yeah. events and stuff that we get to cover as journalists, as, as you will know, Cash, you know, it's great because you get to go and you're like, actually, you're, you're almost like feeding off of what the room is. And then a room full of 
a connection to the survivors or or the people that lost their life in the charity uh, in the tragedy is a, is a really interesting way of coming in. So I think something will come out of this. I hope so. Based on the <laughs> fact that you're just providing this fertile ground for it to grow yeah. from, and, so and, you, and you're willing to collaborate. Yeah. That there's so many stories, John, within the story. So it's yeah. not just about my grandfather. Everybody's got a story to tell yeah. that yeah. were on SS Tilawa. Yeah. So yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, so I mean, I mean, Amil will tell you what we're going to be doing um, on the eightieth. It's it's become. We thought it might just be a few people, but now I think we, you know, the guest list gets bigger and bigger. So it, it, we're really looking forward to a very special evening. Yeah, and obviously you've still got seventeen today, seventeen days to go, so it could get even bigger. So Emil, just tell us what what have you got in line uh, lined up for the eightieth? So what we're going to do, uh, we will have. Approximately 50 people attending the commemoration. The day before, we'll have the opportunity to have a radio interview, to have a press conference in the afternoon. Uh, the British Deputy High Commissioner, Mr. Alan Gemmell, has accepted our invitation to be the chief guest. So all going well, he'll be able to attend. And uh, we have a, a good variety of people that will be attending the commemoration from our family, uh, some in the UK, some from uh, the village of Kacholi, Gujarat. And uh, we also have, of course, Mr. Irvin Bajani, the last known survivor who has booked his ticket and he will be attending with his wife and daughter. The, the Patels that I referred to earlier from the Midlands, they will also be attending. So it's gonna be a program of between 45 minutes to an hour. And there'll be an opportunity to provide a keynote address to summarize the, the big picture, uh, some of the interesting connections uh, that, that we've uh, observed, and uh, also some interviews pre-recorded, some live. And then we'll have a, a little dinner afterwards. And yeah, we're... We're really looking forward to it, actually. Even the day before on the Tuesday, November 22nd, we'll have an opportunity to do a walk, a tour around the Ballard estate and try and figure out, well, where did my great-grandfather arrive on, you know, on at the train station uh, coming off the Flying Rani from Nosari? Where did he buy his tickets? Where did he potentially sleep and have that meal, the, the Iranian cafe down the street that's over 100 years old, did he perhaps get a chai there? Um, you know, did did any of his family come to see him off, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just going to try and relive the moment, his last time at home, and then, of course, what it was like for the survivors when they get to, to be with Mr. Jani and to think that he was three years old coming back off HMS Birmingham, that's going to be a privilege for us to be with him in that moment. And also knowing that his other children and grandchildren can't be there with us in India, but we're there with him. I mean, that's really lovely. Yeah, it's good. Well, listen, um, I wish you well for the next 17 days <laughs> um, and then the event itself. And uh, listen, you know, when you get a, a moment to yourselves, amongst your busy schedule maybe between now and christmas and you want to come back and you know we, we can do a, a further conversation mm -hmm. about that if that's mm -hmm. helpful it's great it's, it's excellent for you to share i think you know certainly looking at um, maybe what's been done previously with the um the lusitania that was sunk in 1915 that was a, a passenger ship that was sunk in, in obviously in world war one um you know almost ha how is ha some some people that are ahead of you if you like when it comes to how are they preserving it what they're doing there's a lot of lessons to be learned i think by looking at other uh tragedies at different times in different conflicts as well it's definitely one i would uh, encourage you to do and of course you know we're, we're here to support you as much as we can and it's been a real honor to speak to you both today thank you very much cash thanks very much yeah thank you john thank you very much and thanks very much emil appreciate it thank you